Hello, my name is Mark Boyanowski. I am an associate professor and director of the Genital Urinary Cancers Program in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Stanford University. In this series, I'll be speaking about radiation therapy for prostate cancer. cancer. My background includes a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Lafayette College, a Master's of Science in Medical Physics from Columbia University. I received my doctorate from New Jersey Medical School and my radiation oncology residency was conducted at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Nationally, I've contributed to various societies uh, I've served as secretary and treasurer of the board for the American Brachytherapy Society, I've held various positions within ASTRO, our International Society of Radiation Oncology, and presently I serve as chair of the Emerging Technologies Committee. I'm a member of the Genital Urinary Committee for the American Board of Radiology, and I participate in a group called the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group, which is a legacy group of a now larger group called Energy Oncology that conducts uh, national clinical trials. This is part of the team in our department uh, who work most closely with me, delivering care for prostate cancer patients. It includes a physician assistant, uh, a genital urinary fellow, and my administrative assistant. And we take personal quality care very seriously. As part of our routine work, we're sure to help coordinate care the best we can among patients, doctors, and caregivers. An example of this is a expedited same-day consultation letter that's sent to your doctors to uh, facilitate communication. We also are sure to discuss all of your treatment options and help balance them in terms of your preferences. We try to minimize the burden of treatment by avoiding as many scheduling inconveniences as possible. And we're always there to help, even with the smallest detail uh, or emotional need. Shared decision making um, is an emerging concept in oncology care that I believe is an important one. And what this study showed was that patient satisfaction was greater for patients who perceived control and experienced shared decision making uh, as part of their cancer treatment. And so when consulting with patients, I'm always sure to engage them in the process of decision making and to enhance the perception of control in the process. When prostate cancer is diagnosed, first important step is assessing the aggressiveness of the cancer its likelihood of spreading and risk of occurrence. This is done commonly using a risk stratification model where the most common one used is that of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It utilizes three major factors, the PSA level from the blood test, the Gleason score, which is a number from the biopsy, and the T stage, which is an evaluation of the prostate and tumor from the digital rectal exam. Cancers are then classified as low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. For example, a patient with a PSA level of 15 and a T2B tumor on digital rectal exam with a Gleason score of eight would be categorized as high risk.
Despite this strict categorical classification, however, most times in real life, risk behaves more as a continuum. What this slide attempts to illustrate is the gradual process by which cancers can increase in risk from low risk to intermediate risk and high risk. For example, patients in the intermediate risk group could be further subclassified as slightly on the lower end towards lower risk or slightly towards the higher end near high risk. Various factors can be used to further subclassify risk. Factors such as the volume of the cancer can be examined. And there are various ways to do this, including determining the percentage of biopsy cores that were involved with cancer, or examining the length of each core that was involved with cancer. You can further look at the primary Gleason score pattern. Gleason scoring is a number based on the pattern of the cancer under the microscope. The numbers range from 6 to 10, where 6 is low, 7 is the middle, 8, 9, 10 is high. This number is composed of two parts, a primary pattern, which comprises most of the cancer, and a secondary pattern. When a patient has a Gleason score 7, the primary pattern can be either Gleason 3 or Gleason 4, and so this can further help substratify risk. Last, you can look at how many risk factors uh, are present for patients with intermediate risk disease. For example, a patient with one intermediate risk factor may behave and respond to treatment differently than a patient with three intermediate risk factors. In general, all patients with prostate cancer have the option of surgery, radiation therapy, or a conservative approach of just monitoring the PSA and digital rectal exams with, without treatment. The one caveat, however, is that as risk increases, for patients who choose radical prostatectomy or radiation ther therapy, additional treatments may be required as risk increases. For example, patients who choose to have surgery may find that they are recommended to receive radiation therapy after. And for patients who choose to have radiation therapy, they may find that they're recommended to receive additional hormonal therapy in combination with radiation. What's important to remember is that a diagnosis of prostate cancer is not immediately life-threatening. In fact, 10-year survival rates show that the likelihood of dying of prostate cancer is far less than that of dying from other causes. The most common cause of death in men, especially as they age, is that of cardiovascular disease, which could be complicated by other medical conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. The standard treatment options available at Stanford University include external beam radiotherapy, which is delivered with a volumetric modulated arc technique, which is a form of intensity modulated radiotherapy, or IMRT. This is delivered in either conventional fractionation, using 40 treatments or fractions over approximately eight weeks, or a moderate hypofractionated technique, delivering treatment 
in 26 treatments. This is possible because current technology allows us to deliver a slightly higher radiation dose each day and deliver treatment over an overall shorter period of time. Patients are often advised about the benefits of brachytherapy. At Stanford, we use a high dose rate, or HDR, temporary prostate implant technique. And for patients with unfavorable intermediate or high-risk disease, androgen deprivation therapy may be used, which can be delivered for durations from anywhere from four months to 36 months. In general, as the risk of the prostate cancer increases, there is treatment intensification. And you could see that by the layering effect in which patients with low risk disease may be uh, suitably treated with an external beam technique alone using VMAT. And high risk patients are often optimally treated with combinations of therapy such as VMAT, the HDR brachytherapy, and androgen deprivation therapy. There are two treatments that I will not be discussing and are not available at Stanford. They are proton therapy, which is a form of external beam radiotherapy. Currently, there are no well-established advantages to proton therapy over photon therapy that is used as part of VMAT. And I will not be discussing low-dose rate permanent prostate brachytherapy which is an alternative to the temporary high-dose rate brachytherapy. I'll be discussing this in a little further detail. I will also be discussing two treatments, HDR monotherapy and stereotactic body radiotherapy that are being offered as part of clinical trials at Stanford. Over the last two and a half decades, the most important thing we've learned about treating prostate cancer with radiation therapy is that more is better. This is a collection of phase three randomized clinical trials that all indicate that higher radiation dose improves outcome in prostate cancer. They show that an approximate eight to 10 gray increase in radiation dose, where gray is the unit of measure like centimeter is to length, increases PSA control about 10%. What's more, in some subgroups of prostate cancer, higher radiation dose appears to improve survival. And results from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center suggest that further dose escalation may be beneficial. Now I'll present some concepts about VMAT. Stanford has a long history of treating prostate cancer. These are figures from a report by Dr. Malcolm Bagshaw, the second chairman of the Department of Radiation Oncology from his publication in 1965, which was the first to show that you could cure prostate cancer with radiation. He knew that the best way to concentrate radiation in the prostate was to use a arc-based technique. And he accomplished this by using a Lazy Susan type device with patients standing on it and mimicked a rotisserie type motion where patients were rotated while radiation was directed to the prostate. It was a very clever technique and was monumental in our field. This is a video of a patient receiving VMAT today. As you can see, the patient is laying flat on his back, 
immobilized with a device holding his legs still, while the machine rotates around focusing radiation at the prostate. The patient doesn't see the radiation, they don't smell it, they don't see it. The patient does not feel sick or nauseous and has no restrictions during treatment. Overall, treatment time takes about two to three minutes. While the machine is rotating, a device called a multi-leaf collimator is adjusting the shape and size of the radiation beam to ensure that it is conformal to the prostate, concentrating the radiation inside while minimizing the exposure to the surrounding normal tissues such as the rectum and bladder. What you can see here on the right is a contour of the prostate shown in red while the radiation is concentrated inside, which is the white uh, appearance. This is an illustration of how the radiation is concentrated in and around the prostate and seminal vesicles. On the left, you can see a description of the anatomy showing the prostate, bladder, rectum, seminal vesicles, and proximal portions of the penis called the penile bulb and corporeal bodies. On the right is a topography map of the radiation dose similar to an elevation map, where lines towards the center represent the greatest radiation dose. What radiation oncologists do is devise the delivery of radiation that concentrates the radiation inside while sparing the normal surrounding tissues. This is accomplished with a simulation or mapping procedure. Stanford University, patients are simulated with a CAT scan and an MRI to create a map of where the radiation will go. What I do as the physician is draw on that map each of the various structures that are important for the treatment planning, such as the prostate, the rectum, the bladder, the rectile tissues, bowel, and any other structures that are sensitive. It is customary to use CT scanning for this mapping procedure. This is a standard throughout the country. However, you can see that these pictures may sometimes be difficult to interpret. At Stanford, we routinely use MRI scans because we can achieve much greater definition of the target and normal tissues. In addition to creating the best map possible to deliver the radiation, is ensuring that we hit the prostate every day. This is routinely accomplished with the use of implanted gold fiducial markers. They're small gold seeds the size of a dry grain of rice that are implanted into the prostate with a procedure similar to the biopsy, although not as traumatic. Here you can see on the left three green circles that represent the location of the gold seeds on the initial mapping procedure. Each day before your treatment, Lying on the table, an x-ray is performed to visualize the gold seeds that appear as small white dots. The therapist's job in positioning you on the table before treatment begins 
is to simply align the little white dots and the little green circles to ensure that the prostate is on the mark before we begin. Similarly, this can be achieved with the use of a CAT scan. Our equipment enables us to do a CAT scan before each treatment. And this is done on a weekly basis as a double check and quality assurance measure. Here is a typical schedule for a patient receiving VMAT. It would be scheduled to come into the department on a Wednesday where the gold markers are implanted into the prostate and the CAT scan and the MRI are required for the mapping procedure. Two weeks later, they would return to receive their first treatment, which is then delivered Monday through Friday, five days a week, no weekends or holidays for either 26 or 40 treatments. Shown here is a list of the potential side effects of a course of radiation therapy. Side effects occurring during and immediately following radiation therapy are largely attributed to swelling and inflammation of the bladder, prostate, and rectum. These side effects are often easily controlled with over-the-counter anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen. It's typical for patients to report increases in daytime and nighttime urinary frequency or urgency. They may experience mild discomfort or burning with urination as well. Patients find that they sometimes have an increased number of bowel movements or looser bowel movements. Mild fatigue is also possible, especially as the days and weeks of treatment add up, but patients have no restrictions and are encouraged to continue their daily exercise regimens and activities. Additional side effects in the months and years following radiation therapy are also possible. It's very typical for patients to report a greater sense of urinary urgency. This usually means that they time their restroom visits accordingly. They go to the bathroom before leaving the house and upon arriving at their destination and commonly stop to use the restroom along the way. However, it's important to remember that leaking urine, laughing, sneezing, coughing, or lifting heavy objects is not expected after radiation therapy. Patients sometimes report leaking one or two drops of urine in their shorts if they can't get to the bathroom in time because they're in unfamiliar surroundings or not near a bathroom. For this reason, it's common for patients to report wearing a pad in their shorts for confidence. Keep in mind, permanent rectal or bladder injury requiring serious treatment, such as surgery, is a rare consequence of radiation therapy. Erectile dysfunction is an often asked about consequence of prostate cancer treatment. Recent evidence suggests that one out of five patients suffer a decline in erectile dysfunction following a course of radiation therapy. Erectile dysfunction after radiation therapy is most commonly related to impaired blood flow to the proximal portion of the penis near the prostate. This type of erectile dysfunction responds favorably to medications like Cialis or Levitra and is effective in 7 out of 10 men in helping to improve erectile dysfunction. The erectile tissues are easily identifiable on MRI, which we use standardly at Stanford. This allows us to 
better spare the erectile tissues by imposing dose constraints in the treatment planning process. We are hopeful that further lowering the dose received by the erectile structures will further improve erectile function in the future. The next part of this discussion will focus on brachytherapy. Prostate brachytherapy is radiation from the inside out. This is achieved by implanting hollow needles into the prostate with ultrasound guidance through the skin between the scrotum and the anus. At Stanford, our prostate brachytherapy program is centered on a real-time ultrasound-based high-dose rate technique. This technique has several advantages over permanent low-dose rate brachytherapy. The radiation exposure is temporary and there are no implanted radioactive seeds left behind, which means there are no restrictions to young children. Because no loose radioactive seeds are left behind, there is no risk that these seeds could move to other parts of the body. The radiation therapy delivery is also improved. We can achieve a greater concentration of radiation in the prostate and better conform the radiation to treat problematic areas such as cancer that has penetrated through the capsule of the prostate or penetrated the seminal vesicles. Radiation therapy given at a high dose rate is also more lethal to the cancer cells. Another advantage of the Stanford HDR technique is the use of ultrasound for treatment planning. This is a newer technology not widely available. It's important because it eliminates the need for a CT scan. Traditionally, CT scans have been used to design the HDR treatment. CT scans are problematic, however, because they require moving the patient from the operating table to a stretcher and a CT scan. All of this movement opens the door for the needles, which were carefully placed in the prostate, to move. Using ultrasound, we have very high confidence that the needles are exactly where we intend them to be. This slide illustrates the ability to concentrate radiation within the prostate using various radiation therapy techniques. On the top left, you can see a VMAT technique. The two top right techniques are proton techniques. And on the bottom, on the left, low dose rate brachytherapy, and on the right, high dose rate brachytherapy. These pictures are very similar to a topography map for elevation. You can see that the radiation is best concentrated in and around the prostate with HDR. This figure illustrates the effect of dose rate on cancer cell killing. Each curve represents a different rate of radiation delivery. You can see there are fewer surviving cancer cells with high dose rate compared to low dose rate brachytherapy. Here you can compare the image quality of CT based versus ultrasound based imaging for treatment plan. This slide illustrates how it's possible to implant a seminal vesicle that's cancerous. On the right, you can see a needle implanted directly within the cancerous seminal vesicle. This gives us great confidence 
that we can concentrate the dose within the tumor. Prostate brachytherapy is a same-day outpatient procedure performed under general anesthesia. Patients are asked to undergo routine pre-admission testing, including an EKG, chest x-ray, and blood work. After arriving at the hospital, patients are transported to our operative suite in the Radiation Oncology Department. General anesthesia is administered and a urinary catheter is placed into the penis. Patients are positioned supine with their legs up as shown here. An ultrasound probe is inserted into the rectum and pictures are captured and transferred to monitors for the treatment team. Together with a team of physicists, a treatment plan is devised based on the needle placement in your ultrasound imaging. Each hollow needle is then connected to a catheter, which is connected to the delivery device. The remote afterloader contains a radioactive source of iridium. This is connected to a cable, which is connected to a motor. The computer software controls the motor to drive the cable and the source in and out of each catheter and hollow needle into your prostate, where it pauses temporarily, radiating the prostate from the inside out. The entire treatment takes about 10 minutes. Upon completion of the treatment, the needles are removed and the patient is transferred to the recovery area. Once the effects of anesthesia have worn off, the urinary catheter is removed. Once the patient is able to urinate, he is discharged home, usually mid to late afternoon. Several studies have shown that the intensification and dose escalation of HDR brachytherapy is beneficial in curing prostate cancer. This slide shows the experience from the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute in Australia. When HDR is used, an approximate 10% benefit in PSA control was observed in five years. A similar benefit was observed at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York. In this review, found that optimal survival and biochemical control was achieved when HDR was used compared to LDR and external beam treatment alone. These observations are most likely related to the ability of HDR to further escalate dose. It is hypothesized that combining VMAT and HDR delivers a dose on the order of 90 to 100 gray. This is roughly 10 to 20 gray more than is achievable using an external beam technique alone, such as VMAT. This is a typical schedule for a patient undergoing combined VMAT and HDR. Patients undergoing HDR may also experience some additional side effects. Bleeding is possible. There's also a risk of infection, but antibiotics are used during and after the implant. There's a small risk that patients may require a urinary catheter beyond the day of the procedure. Following the completion of radiation therapy, patients are followed on a periodic basis with PSA levels and digital rectal exams. This slide illustrates PSA levels for two populations of patients. 
on the bottom, PSAs for patients whose cancer appears to be controlled. On the top, the PSA levels of patients whose prostate cancer is returned. You can see, following radiation therapy, PSA levels decline to some low level, usually less than one, after about two years. At that point, PSA levels usually remain stable and low. For patients who have prostate cancer return, they may begin to appreciate, after an initial decline in PSA, a very gradual increase after about one to two years. This is usually the first sign that prostate cancer is recurring. If PSA levels raise concern about recurrence, then typically we begin looking for prostate cancer with scans such as a CAT scan and a bone scan. If these indicate spread, the next appropriate treatment is hormonal therapy. For patients whose scans are negative, a rebiopsy of the prostate looking for persistence of prostate cancer may be appropriate. This is appropriate for patients who are considering a second treatment to the prostate. Second treatments of the prostate may include surgery, brachytherapy, or cryosurgery. If PSA levels raise concern about recurrence, then typically we begin looking for prostate cancer with scans such as a CAT scan and a bone scan. If these indicate spread, the next appropriate treatment is hormonal therapy. For patients whose scans are negative, a rebiopsy of the prostate looking for persistence of prostate cancer may be appropriate. This is appropriate for patients who are considering a second treatment to the prostate. Second treatments of the prostate may include surgery, brachytherapy, or cryosurgery. For patients who receive hormonal therapy, the pattern of PSA after treatment is different. While hormonal therapy is being delivered, PSA levels should be zero. When hormone therapy stops, the PSA is expected to rise, although gradually and minimally. If the PSA levels continue to rise, this may signal return of prostate cancer and warrant further investigation. In this figure, the lower curve shows PSA values for patients who have control of their prostate cancer without recurrence. The upper curve is PSA levels for patients who are later found to have recurrence of PSA. This final section will discuss two clinical trials at Stanford. There are two emerging treatments for the treatment of prostate cancer. The first is the use of high dose rate brachytherapy alone for the treatment of prostate cancer and the second stereotactic body radiotherapy or SBRT. At Stanford clinical trial is being conducted that allows patients with low, intermediate, or high-risk prostate cancer to be treated with HDR monotherapy alone without the use of supplemental external beam radiotherapy. The hope is that we can deliver adequate amounts of radiation dose to the prostate with an HDR technique in order to eliminate the need for an external beam radiotherapy component. 
This significantly shortens the overall treatment time and reduces the burden of treatment. Similarly, stereotactic body radiotherapy and external beam technique may be possible. Soon, a clinical trial for patients with low-risk prostate cancer will be available for patients to receive treatment on an every other day basis over approximately two weeks. Thank you for listening to this informational session. I hope you have found it helpful.